well what it, it what it was cool about you asking me to do this is it really made me think of like well why are these movies the ones that like trigger or make yeah. me think back you know over yeah. the the period of life or whatnot and it was yeah. pretty much if you really think about it the practical effects <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Voices from the Mausoleum, and welcome back to another episode of Five Influential Horror. Um, today, I'm joined by Albert from Blood and Bruce, um, who's been on my channel before. We recently did a movie review for An American Werewolf in London. Um, I'll try to remember to put that in the cloud so you can go check that episode out. Um, and today, we're going to be talking his five influential horror movies and why he picked them. So thanks for coming back. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Uh, do you want to tell everyone... Some stuff about Blood and Bruise, what you do over on your channel? Um, Blood and Bruise is basically me and a friend review horror movies. I do unboxings, and usually I'm drinking a beer of some sort on there, and I'll like rate it one to five or whatnot and kind of do a brief description of what type of beer it is. Um, other than that, I mean, sometimes I'll do... Um, trailer reviews and stuff like that yeah but just all around horror and uh halloween type stuff yeah in case the background does not get that away i know right <laughs> <laughs> it actually hates horror <laughs> <laughs> not a fan <laughs> Yeah, so um, this is another list that's, uh, this hasn't happened very often, where literally not a single thing on here has been talked about before, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, so let's just jump in. So the first one on your list was the 1982 Michael Jackson's Thriller. Yes, I honestly, I, I just remember being like a very small child, and one of my first memories is watching him turn into that werewolf slash werecat i don't know what it was sure and chasing that girl through the woods after their car breaks down yeah and to me as a little kid watching that it just free it freaked me out a little bit just i don't know and i thought for that for if you really think about that time frame mm -hmm. that was a pretty good transformation for that time period i mean look comparing it to other transformations around that yeah and i think too opinion. like what's interesting is like you think about it being for you know like the music video element of it when it's like it's not it's not some like you know two and a half hour long production they spent two you know two years writing it like trying to get it it's it's yeah i i think it is uh a yeah, really, really well done for its time. The amount of time spent on it in general is is pretty impressive. And not to mention one of like the masters of like what someone that's been in horror like forever was uh, Vincent Price. Vincent did, Price. Like, the like voiceover on there. Ugh, yeah. So and good. so that was such like a big deal too. Yeah, like if you were going to have anyone narrate this horror story, like he was the one to do it. Oh, that's true. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I had I to rewatch it. Knowing that we were going to do this, I had to rewatch Thriller, like, I think it was last night. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of remind myself of, like, that childhood feeling that I got was... Just... And, of course, the music video, I mean... Right. And the whole them being in the theater and everything. I don't know when the last time you watched it was, but it just brings back that nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I also like that it doesn't really have like a happy ending. It kind of has that moment of like <laughs> when there's that turn and you're you think like, oh, whew, you know, <laughs> they made it, they're fine, and then he like turns and the eyes change and the laugh comes. You're just like, oh, maybe not. <laughs> like his eyes too. look so awesome when he turned like that. And they're all yellow, like cat eyes, basically. Yeah, because I'm not. I'm. I don't really know what he was supposed to be either because it definitely looks like it could be a couple of things 
I was assumed they were probably going for werewolf, but I could definitely see it being just like a shapeshifter or something like something else, but really well done. Yeah. The Rotor. zombies too, though. The fact that he, they had all those zombies dancing in unison, all makeup out and dressed up like that, climbing out of the graves and stuff. I mean, I don't know. There's something about it. Just the whole thing yeah. was just creepy. And, um, yeah, it messed with me. It stuck with me, that that initial part. Like I said, I don't know why. It, it's just stuck with me since childhood. Yeah. And I always go back to that, like, thing. And I'm like, yeah, that was, that was part of the reason why I think, you know. Yeah. Well, and I think, like, I mean, I don't remember necessarily, like, the first time I ever saw it. But I do know enough or remember enough rather that like I was pretty it scared it freaked me out. Like I remember being young enough when I saw it for the first time that it it definitely scared me, too, which being younger and there being the music element and some of the other stuff, too, like you would think like it was kind of such a strange concept in general. It's really unique. And I think but I, I do remember it being pretty scary and. Now it's just kind of iconic. Like people just, you know, people know the dance. It's been in movies, you know, like, so, um, yeah, I remember being scared the first time I ever watched it. It's cause it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely creepy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cool. Your second one was uh, one I had not seen actually. Um, I think it's the only one on here that I had not seen. Yeah. Are we talking um, about faces of death? Yep, 1978, Faces of Death. Yep. And what, oddly enough, like within the last week, I think, mm -hmm. I heard that they're going to remake it somehow with that that lifeguard dude that was in Stranger Things, which is odd to me. And he's going to be the, the coroner or he's going to be like part of the, just that he's going to be in I, it? I didn't read that much into it. It was just something I glanced across and I saw a couple people on Instagram like post about it, but I was still kind of like thrown back like, oh my gosh, they're actually going to re, like, how do you remake this? Like, because I want to say some clips were made up, but some were real from my understanding. That was my um, understanding too. Yeah. When I looked into it before I watched it. I, that yeah, that was my understanding. That some of the you know some of the stuff obviously was fake, but not necessarily all of it. So you actually watched it? Yeah. Uh, what did you? What was your opinion of it? Um, I think. Well, it depends. What makes it? You tell me what what makes it influential for you, and and then I'll um then I'll tell you what my thoughts were. So I was a little kid, and I had was visiting my aunt's house and it was just me and my older cousin was there and he uh, just put this tape in. Mm -hmm. And the thing that sticks out for me from this movie mm -hmm. mainly was the scene where you got a bunch of, of Americans and they're sitting around a table and then they bring a monkey in. And then they put them in that cage in the middle of the table. Yeah. And then yeah. that, that to me as a kid messed me up watching them like hit it in the head. Yeah. And then them like cut the head open mm -hmm. and then them start eating the monkey brains. Mm -hmm. I mean, and to be honest, for the longest time, I honestly thought that was real. I thought that was a real scene that really happened. It wasn't till like years later I found out that was made up. The little things that they were using were like foam. Oh, okay. And that it was cauliflower, like that they were eating with. Uh, Not actual um, monkey brains, yeah. Exactly. But when I first watched it, I honestly thought all this was real. And I thought I was watching a real thing go down. And so that's why that movie messed me up as a kid, like seeing that I was just like, Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's presented like a, you know, like it's real. Like, I mean, as far as like the storytelling part of it, I think, I think it's different for me, obviously. Cause like it was a first watch and I'm like, you know, in my mid thirties. So like watching it as, you know, at this age is like a completely, you know, obviously very different than what you experiencing it. 
um, being younger. Um, I mean, I, I try, I'm trying to like think of if I had to like express my thoughts. I think, um, I think it's, it's always wild to go back and see something, you know, before the nineties, like anything like eighties, seventies, anything older like that. When you go back and watch it in as a first watch, you'd kind of like have to remember, like you just kind of have to put yourself in a different mindset when you're watching something older because it's just not going to be like what we see, you know, now. Um, I will say that for this to have come out in 78, I can easily see someone watching this in the time frame that this was said, that this happened in and being like, yeah, this is real. Like, I mean, it, even now it's, I mean, it, it seems like there's a lot of stuff that looked very real to me. Like I can, I feel like amazingly enough, probably because it's so practical, like a lot of that stuff or it's all practical, all that stuff like held up really well. Um, yeah. I think. I'm trying to think if there was any of another one that made me, I think the monkey one probably made me the most uncomfortable too. Mostly because it's like a animal one, probably like I said, like when I saw um, cannibal Holocaust for the first time, like <laughs> <laughs> ruined, it ruined my life. Um, yeah, no, I think it's, I I'm glad I watched it. If that makes sense. Cause I, like I said, I'd never heard of it and there's more than one, right? Yeah. They have like a whole collection. It's like a series. But yeah. I want to say I was under 10 years of age when I first saw that. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty yeah. sure I was like under 10. And but that's the only scene that I really remember was that. Like there's some other things I remember, but for the most part, that's what really was influential to me. It was just like, yeah, that was kind of like gross. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and I'm thinking too, because I've seen so much stuff from, other time frames, like I can, I'm like thinking back on other things I've seen before watching this for the first time. There's definitely quite a few things that I think have drawn influence from this as far as other films. Um, like one of the first things that came to mind as far as like kind of the setup of what's happening and like what, what we're watching to begin with is there's this, um, there's this indie film called, um, is it, it's like, the mortuary collection or the mortuary i think that's right mortuary collection have you seen that is it the one that i want to say there was something like that on netflix but i'm not sure um i'm not this one was on something else originally it eventually came to shutter but it had been out you know for a little bit before it came on shutter so maybe it was on netflix first but it's the one that takes place in a funeral home and oh, oh, oh okay like, Maybe it was Shudder. I think I did see okay. that. Like, uh -huh. yeah. So that so that's a very mild version of Faces of Death. But I just kind of could see like maybe they maybe the guy that made it maybe pulled from it because there was just a couple things in it that reminded me of that. Um, maybe possibly just because the setting takes place in a um, in a funeral home. But there's just some things like thinking back to other films where I could be like, oh, I feel like this probably influenced other filmmakers that when eventually they made their horror film, this is where they got some of their, their stuff from. Um, yeah. I'll have to, I'm going to be curious, like how accessible some of the other ones are. Cause I would be interested to see the others. Have you seen I, any of the others in the series? I, I don't think I have. I, uh, if, if I have, it's just been bits and pieces that I like pulled sure. off of, or, or watched off of YouTube. I've thought about ordering the entire collection. Mm-hmm just to have them you know yeah because again it was something that i watched growing up and i like i again i'm one of those people that likes having like a bunch of dvds like having a big the whole horror yeah. collection with like yeah. the weird stuff the stuff that's not really something anybody wants to watch but just the fact that i have it i don't know why like i have a serbian film over there and i keep thinking about watching it but then there's part of me that's like i'm not really wanting to watch it because i've heard so many weird negative things about it and it's like but i keep eyeing it like it's right there <laughs> you know it's like calling me but it's like ah, i don't know if today's the day <laughs> yeah that was a one and done for me that was a i've seen it i can say i've seen it i'm good like i don't now, what version did you see of it? Because I heard there's two versions and they differ by like uh, like 45 seconds or something. And But that there's one oh, part. Really? 
that I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't think I knew that there were two versions. Mm. So I'm not sure. It was okay. a it was a relatively recent watch in the last, I would say like maybe a couple years ago. Um, so I mean, I don't know if it's something where they, you know, maybe the first one that came out was is the one that had like the the more the longer time and then they changed some stuff when they re re released it or something like that. I'm not sure if it's like that, but I've seen I mean I'd have to look. I don't know. Whatever one I saw, it was on a service. I watched it on or maybe I rented it. I don't remember. It's been a couple of years ago, but and that there's a lot of like that, like human centipede, one and done, uh cannibal holocaust, one and done. Human centipede was a trap for me. Those type of movies, I, I feel like I'm almost laughing at the situations more than being like, because it's so over the top and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And that doctor in that movie was so like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, um, not a fan. And I've only seen that one. I've only seen the first one. I haven't seen any of the other ones. I'm good on that front. <laughs> <laughs> Really, like, what else is there? I'm like, I just, yeah. but yeah, no, this was this was one I had not, um, I had not seen. I don't even know if I had heard of it or if I had it, just you know, it might have been in passing or something. But it does make me curious to see how what the others are like in comparison to. Well, I um, want to say you're kind of into found footage type stuff already, right? Yeah, and I want to say it was just like segments of different stuff because. Me personally, I haven't watched Faces of Death for years. Like I haven't, yeah. I haven't rewatched it. Yeah. Um, again, I've thought I've considered buying it just for to have in the collection, maybe mm -hmm. trying to like watch it here or there. But yeah, it's yeah, it's see, it's very um uh like uh, anthology feeling. Like it, it kind of feels like you know different stories more or less, but different just. Instead of like all these backgrounds and character arcs, you just get like gore and insanity. Right. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. That's um, why I keep thinking, like, man, I saw that as a little kid. What was what was going on? I know on? when you said under 10, I was like, oh my god. Yeah, I just remember uh I just remember that movie being like, okay, like everything else now is mild. Yeah, I imagine there's some, yeah, everything else would probably be an easy watch and, like, become desensitized <laughs> after watching. Well, it's tough these days because when I go into a horror movie, I'm I'm looking to be taken, taken out of it, you know what I mean, and be a little bit either creeped out or scared or grossed yeah. out or something, right? And it's yeah. really, nothing really reaches that. And I think that just, you know, movies have made us desensitized for the most part. I mean, you see Terrifier yeah. and it's hard to really be, I don't know what the word would be, like scared or creeped out by that. For me, because I think that there's the humor of Art the Clown, right? And he's just like mm -hmm. being funny throughout the Oh, movie. sure. So it's just like, for me, I it's, saying. Yeah. It's, it's, it's more of like a, a humorous thing. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I experienced not that long ago in, in watching um, a horror movie where I was kind of pulled back into that feeling of like, oh my God, that's awful, like like really being unsettled or disturbed or whatever, um, was I saw um, Sleepaway Camp a couple months ago. It was a first watch. I'd never seen it. And there's a there's that scene in the um in the kitchen where the cook gets all that hot water dumped on him and they yeah there's that and the whole film it does this multiple times but this one was probably the worst for me as far as like ugh. but like the the camera lingers on these these moments like that and so as you're watching the skin like bubble and pop and it's like it was just like that was the first time in a really long time where i was just like i genuinely like almost felt pain like watching it like it was so like just uncomfortable creeped out unsettled like I just felt awful wa like watching it I couldn't look away of course because that's just how it works but it was one of those things where it was just like it was the first thing in a really long time that had made me feel that way and it was a movie from the 80s 80s yeah. I think it's 80s yeah 80s movies I'm telling you yeah that's <laughs> 80s is four of your 
I, I love the 80s movies. I feel like they have the most feel to them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's a testament to that by the fact that you could go back and watch it as much time has passed and it being a first watch and it still be effective. Because that's, I mean, that's definitely how I felt um, when I saw Sleepaway Camp. It definitely felt like I was like a kid watching this back. Yeah. So I, yeah, the eighties horror is a very different, um, it's just on its own thing altogether. Um, yeah. So your number three is, um, the howling 1981. So my dad has a cabin up in the foothills. So it's, it's like very hilly, very rocky, very, very wooded, like thick. Okay. And like, if you were to go out at night and walk on the dirt road to get to his house, like it, the, the trees are so dense and thick, like you have to look up and use like the, the moonlight to get right. Dang. Yeah. So after watching the howling, like going up there to visit on the weekends was like the most scariest thing in my entire <laughs> life. Yeah. Like it messed me up so bad. <laughs> because rem if you rewatch the howling they're in that big campground area yeah where you know and they show the window open and you hear the howling outside and the fog and everything and it's so dense and dark and just it's scary yeah yeah so that's yeah. why I, I chose that one i mean and there's several transformations in there that are in my opinion pretty good I feel like they definitely took advantage of the dark also. As yeah, where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the other one? American Werewolf was no, super lit in, in that well-lit area. It's, where, yeah. This one's like, it's in a dark office room and mm -hmm. this person's transforming into a werewolf and they, mm -hmm. they already look freaky before they change. And then they, <laughs> right? And then they change into this this fucking werewolf, and then they're like, it's just a whole nother level, and you're just so. Yeah the the howling is like an annual rewatch because I mean you know like I'm a I'm a werewolf fan. I we talked you know when we did the um, American Werewolf as far as like just werewolf films in general and what they're like now versus what they were like and and things like transformations and i know that that's something and it's also the type of werewolf that you like too because it's not it's like a monster werewolf it's not like a um you know it doesn't just look like an ordinary like wolf um but yeah no the howling the howling is i i feel like it's like a i guess i call it like a cult classic i feel like a lot of people when you say you know, anything about werewolf movies, this one and, of course, the other one are the two that always come up no matter what. People always talk about The Howling and they always talk about um, American Werewolf in London. But, um, yeah, The Howling the Howling is is a really, really great werewolf movie. And it's great even now. Like, I rewatch it all the time, or not all the time, but at least once a year. And I'm always in love with it. Like, when it goes off, I, I always feel the exact same way the hundredth time that I did the first. And, it doesn't ever, it's never lost any of its magic. It's well shot. It's well acted. It's, it looks good. It feels creepy. It's scary. Like, I really like The Howling. It's a great movie. Now, if you had to say, which one would you think was more scarier, The Howling or American Werewolf? Hmm. I would, I would probably <laughs> say the howling i think because whereas you still get story i feel like american werewolf is so much story and so much psychological and so much and the howling hat doesn't have as much of that kind of stuff in it as as um america would you what would you say would you say the same thing or you feel well, the other way? i i think american werewolf it's like trying to play both comedy and yeah horror right as sure as where the howling, it's not really trying to be funny. There might be some little parts that are like kind of like, huh. but for the most part, it's trying to take more of a serious, serious tone. Yes. And just the fact that I mean, it opens with them in that uh what is that a uh, sex shop in the back where oh, they're like um, flashing yeah. and she's doing trying to do the it uh, the interview with um 
that that guy right mm -hmm. and then they like that first scene is so just dark and dingy and it just makes you feel dirty without it being even thinking of it being a werewolf movie without even right no yeah take that out of the, the picture it's just a serial killer she's meeting up with him in this dark gross like place where guys go to like you know yep. and and now yeah. you're right now he's like transforming in the dark and then the cops come in and shoot him and like that opening scene to that film is just like <laughs> I, to me it's just like more of a statement of like this is like a serious thing not like a yeah whereas yeah. american werewolf it just felt like more of like a light-hearted fun playful like entertaining movie to me yeah, no, I'm I'm inclined to agree because, you know, when you get all of the background of the, you know, you get the, with the other one, you get the social interactions between the friends in the beginning, and then you get the love story, and you get all these other things, and, I, well, and I think, too, openings, especially when they're, like, the, like the one in, um, in The Howling, they really set a tone, like you're saying, for the rest of the film, because you, after that opening scene, you get a better understanding of like where you need to be as you're going to watch this film. And it is a lot grittier, I guess, than, um, for lack of a better word, I think, um, you know, than American Werewolf in London. And it's, um, yeah, I, I really, it's weird because like I've seen, I feel like I've seen a decent amount of werewolf films. But these, I think these are the two, and we we definitely talked about this a little bit when we talked about the other one, but um, these are like the ones that when I, when I try to think of stuff that's newer, these are the things that I sort of compare it to. Like, does it create the same atmosphere as The Howling? Or do I care enough about the characters like I did in American World of London? Or like, those are the two that I always go back to specifically with Werewolves because they just did the story so well. Um, but yeah, that, yeah, the opening definitely sets, like you, you do feel gross. Like you feel like yuck and you feel uncomfortable and you don't feel safe. I feel like is another thing that it makes you feel. Um, and that's something else that I don't think it's ever lost. I don't think I have ever watched it and not felt uncomfortable or bothered by the things that I'm seeing, which I think is just a testament to how well it's done. Yeah. Also yeah. that scene where, uh, I want to say the woman's getting chased through the woods to that mm -hmm. cabin and yeah. then the werewolf's trying to get in the cabin. That, mm -hmm. that to me was a trip, like actually like feeling like that first person run oh, into a cabin and then yeah. try to get away and then yeah. seeing like the, the werewolf pawing at the ground, like trying to dig under, under it to get in. I yeah. thought that that was pretty cool. Like I, yeah. again, I wish they would have showed more of like the chase yeah. more of like that giving you more of that feeling of like, Oh shit. Like she's about to get got. Yeah. And then she ends up cutting his arm off with, or the hand off with the ax. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I love that movie. So I, th that's I think really the good. one thing that that's off putting to me about the howling is probably the end scene where the reporter turns into the werewolf and it she ends up looking like some weird poodle or something it's like you guys did <laughs> awesome so great the werewolves <laughs> look scary. i was scared of the werewolves all the way through the movie <laughs> then you guys do the last werewolf transformation That's... and i'm like what the what happened what do we yeah that part is do? a little underwhelming yeah i i agree it is and it's funny because like you know endings endings to movies really can make or break them i think they they did so well with the other pieces that I don't like, you know, it, it still ends up being a favorite for me. But yeah, that part is kind of, it was, weird. Like, I don't know, if, maybe not rushed, but it's definitely like a, I don't know, like half baked or something. Like it just didn't see, it didn't really fit. It felt like it was maybe like another part of like a different film or something. I, I, like I said, I loved it. I almost try to think of that as not happening. Like even the, <laughs> even the fact that like, he shot her right when she transformed and she's trying to tell everyone in the world like that's watching the news. Yeah. And then the kids are watching and the people at the <laughs> bar are watching. I mean, I thought that was a really cool idea. Yeah. Just make it look make her look scary instead of like a poodle. That's it. <laughs> are you a fan I of any of the other howlings? I have seen no I don't think I don't think so. 
I've forced myself through pretty much every single one and none of them have even come close in my opinion to the first one. I'm trying to think, um, maybe if I have, I don't know. I feel like I probably have, cause there's five. No. How many is there? I want to say there's like six or seven. I want to say there's like six okay. or seven. Okay. I feel like I probably have, but it would have more than likely it was like a one-time watch and I didn't, I probably didn't go back because I don't remember being a mate. I don't remember being like, oh yeah, I watched, you know, other Howling movies and they were really good. Like, I don't feel, I don't remember feeling that way. So, but I feel like I probably have at least seen maybe one or two of the others. Maybe. I've read that they're, possibly going to do something of a remake on Netflix and it might be like a show. And that makes me kind of nervous, but who knows? You never know. It could, it could really go either way. Well, I'm betting, you know, it's the either way being, it's going to be so good. They'll cancel after one season and we'll hate them (laughs) or, it'll be so bad we won't care. <laughs> but it, but I think that um, I hate when they do series because I, I've i been, they have like broken my heart. I've gotten so attached to shows and then they cancel them after one season or two seasons and they leave them on these huge cliffhangers. It's infuriating. And, me, um, it's, and the, it's like, it's, yeah. For me, it's The Witcher. What they're um, doing with The Witcher show. Oh my gosh. Getting rid of Henry Cavill. I mean, I understand that it was, who who knows what it was about, but still. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't see how the show could come back from that. Like, and I think the casting choice to for the replacement is is weird too. It does seem a little odd. It's because it's Liam Hemsworth, right? And no, no offense to him. I like. I mean, he seems like a great guy, but he's not Henry Cavill, and. We've already gotten so, like, established with the story. Yeah. And it's, like, for me, that was the best yeah. part of the, the show was Henry Cavill fighting all these monsters. Like, I could have yeah. just watched him fight mm-hmm. monsters the whole show, and I would have been happy. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, sorry to go I, off yeah. topic. <laughs> no, no, no. You're fine. I think there's a lot of people that feel that way. Uh, my best friends are getting – did they just finish it? I think they just got caught up on what's out for the witcher and you know they i think they feel the same way you know they they they're a little later in the game but they they got connected to what it was and i said i don't know the the casting choice is so strange to me and i don't know what happened either i've i've read like theories and rumors and like all that but who knows like i don't know why they changed it but yeah netflix doing a series on the howling would be I wouldn't trust it. I would have like they've given me <laughs> trust issues of like. That's how I feel. Yeah, and then sometimes I feel like when they do, um, when Netflix goes like the supernatural route, they make it too CW, and I don't like. You know, I, I think we're similar in that regard. Like, I want like I want something like dark and like fucked up. I don't want some teeny bopper werewolf story like that exists we've seen it i don't need to see that anymore like i don't want that in high school yeah (laughs) yeah yeah i don't want them to 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 like uh dumb it down like because that's what it feels like it's like adding water to this perfect mixture it's like you don't like let the werewolves be for the grown-ups that's fine (laughs) like it doesn't need to be Exactly. You know, another retelling of something like Twilight or Vampire Diaries or whatever. Like, and that's the other thing that they do. Cause I really liked, I wanted to like that show that they did. Um, I'm drawing a total blank on it. It's the one that had the Banshee, the Chupacabra, and the the Succubus. I can't think of the name of the show now. I really wanted to like it because it was it was unique monsters. I thought, okay, this is gonna be something very different. And it was really CW, and I was like, oh. huh. so much potential. Did you ever watch Almost Human? Where's the vampire, the werewolf, and the ghost? Being shit? human, yes. Being, yes. Yes, I, I loved actually, being human. The first couple seasons, I thought were pretty good. So good. I never watched the British one. I only saw the American one. Same. With um, the guy that played, um, oh, God, Josh. The guy that played Josh was 
from something else. I'm drawing a blank now, but no, I loved it. That one was good and weird. And it had some like really crazy dark storylines. Like, and um, yeah, I did not watch the last season because it got canceled and I got like butt hurt and I didn't go back to it. But I think I watched the first two. I think I watched one and two. Penny really Dreadful like was another one that I really got into. Yeah. And then they canceled that after like, I want to say they knew after the second season. And then the third season just kind of was like trying to wrap everything up really quick. So it just felt kind of forced. Yeah, I don't, um, I didn't watch Penny Dreadful, but I, uh, I know I think a lot of people feel that way. And then there, so, so, um, Gilmore, Gil, I was butcher his first name. Del Toro is doing Frankenstein. Oh, and I think that could but, be <laughs> awesome. Where did you hear this from? Um, it just, it just got the information like just came out this past week about it. And it's very, like hush like they haven't talked about story i don't like i have no idea what he's up. adding what he's taking away what i have no idea i just know he is in the process of doing one and the thing is though is i don't think it's specified if it's going to be a movie or a series but he's writing it for netflix i just like how like, dark he makes stuff yeah i mean yeah. well and did you watch his cabinet of curiosities there's some of that I, there were some of them that I really really got into, and then there there were other ones that yeah I, the short stories right that I was yeah. kind of like what yeah oh, I yeah. I thought yeah the Pickman's model with Ben Barnes was one of my favorites, and I also really liked um, shoot the murmuring which was the last one with the I birds. thought the one the one was really cool where they went to the the storage unit. The first one, lot 36 or something. Yeah. I don't know yeah. why when they found that like passageway and that then was they, good. that kind of, that was creepy a little bit. So that's why I was kind of into that. Yeah. I will pretty much watch anything he touches. I even really liked his Pinocchio that he did <laughs> like recently that came out on, I think it was Netflix, but supposedly he's doing Frankenstein and supposedly the rumor is, that he is in discussions with Oscar Isaac, Andrew Garfield, and Mia Goth to be in it. I feel like Mia Goth should should chill on movies for a little bit. <laughs> 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 but whatever, that's fine. I am I'm laughing because like I am normally in the minority on that one because I just had this conversation with my friend yesterday that um that I do the coffee crypt with and I was like I was like I just feel like I mean I know everybody's like super pumped about her but like I just don't I don't know I I do actually feel the same way but what happens of course is I, they these these actors and actresses seems to mostly be actresses they get really really hyped up and people are really pumped about them and then they get put in everything yeah and you're just Jenna like Ortega. yes which I Netflix. love Jenna Ortega, and I think she's actually a really good actress. It's just the Mia Goth thing. I feel like all we do is see her really overly smile and laugh and then act super over the top crazy. Like, I want to see her actually, like, act in, like, a more serious role and have mm -hmm. to actually, like... And then, then I'll be sold on her as an actress, I think. I can see that, yeah. It's almost think, like a typecast. Yeah, Yeah, I think it's going to take a little bit more like of a, a serious role for her to, to like, for me to be, like, a, a fan. Like, I, I, I don't know against some of the films she's been in, but it just seems sure. like she is totally just put into the same. And I'm like, all right, I've seen this character too many times now. Let's show me something different some diversity yeah well and i'm wondering too um i i don't know because it again it doesn't talk about like what he's going to do from like a story perspective or anything but i'm wondering who like if if that were the case like who is she going to be as far as you know if you go back to like the original story so i'm i'm like you know we'll see but but everything he touches especially with monsters is just gold like i love it so much and I just, so that was like, I'm like super 
like our oh God, but I don't want it to be a series because if he does a series for Netflix about one of my favorite monsters and it gets canceled, I'm going to have to burn a village down or something. Like I'm going to be so mad. I, I don't trust them. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Hopefully that, that ends up happening and it ends up being amazing. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Okay. So number four on your list is uh the lost boys 1987 this movie i just always remember watching at my uncle's house as a kid growing up mm -hmm. and thinking how cool it was how just awesome it was and the character um that Corey Haim played mm -hmm. i don't know he was just that kid that was like new to the town and just the two Corys like him and Corey Feldman. Mm -hmm. I mean, growing up and having them as like, you know, the kids you're watching in movies. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, you know, I think that played a big part in it too, you know, but yeah. also God, I think, um, what was that? That one where he got it. He was trying to get his driver's license. That's the other movie that he was in that really sticks out to me. Corey Haim. Um, I hate driver's license. I draw a blank. Anyways, so yeah, him and Corey Feldman, and just the whole vibe of them in Santa Cruz or Santa Clara, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was just awesome. And oh my gosh, I mean, it had a lot of good actors in it, but I loved David. David's you know, character so much too. And now mm -hmm. I can't remember his name. Um, Kiefer Sutherland? Yes. I mm -hmm. love Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland. Flatliners. Yeah. Flatliners is He's great. He's been in some good, some good movies. He Mirrors. really has. Um, yeah. I rewatched Mirrors not that long ago. And that I love movie. Mirrors. It's weird. That's a because good one. At first, I'm not thinking I'm going to like it. And then I get to a part where I'm like, oh my God, I forgot how crazy this movie is. <laughs> mirrors, right there's part yeah. of the movie where like that lady's jaw gets like ripped ripped and and i'm just anyways vampires santa clara i love that movie i love like watching that as a kid it was just that is like probably one of the most good feeling nostalgic movies that i can just put on in yeah. the background or actually sit and watch it and it yeah. just I love that movie so much. Yeah. I have like a um, billion Lost Boys shirts. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I own the, um, I'm not like super into physical media, but I do have a box set with the three movies. Um, but yeah, I, so the Lost Boys was my introduction to vampires. Literally. Right. Like, I mean, that was my, I have a picture. If I can find a good one of it, I'll flash it up when I edit this. Um, where I was a vampire for Halloween and I was a vampire for Halloween because I was obsessed with that movie. Like I, I, like they, there was just something like, you know, like it was, it's interesting because it combines this element of like vampires are cool and edgy, but they're also scary, like scary vampires, which is how they should be. And so it kind of, it's like they had, you know, sex appeal. They had the freedom. They had the power. They were. They dressed cool with their little one earring in and one earring out and whatever. And they had the great hair and like all, you know, all of these things that make them cool. But they were also dangerous monsters. And they were, you know, literally bloodthirsty, like very like, and I, I love that. I mean, you know, it's we, and there's, there's plenty of other vampire films that go dark and have heavier stuff and they're real monsters versus these like, you know, back to the CW kind of stuff. But but this was my introduction to a vampire that could be both, that could be appealing in all these ways that it would make sense that you could be lured in, that you would eventually want to be a part of this. But also they're terrifying and they're very scary and they're out of control. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, this it's iconic. I love The Lost Boys. It's so good. I want to say there's like three points in the film that like kind of like, growing up watching it like kind of mm -hmm. gave you that like unnerving feeling it was the part where they're hanging on to the bridge as the oh, train's going the over train. and yeah. they're trying not to let go 
that yeah. stressed me out so bad. I don't know why. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like trying to hold on and he can't. And then he hears them all down there, like what calling the to hell? him. <laughs> right. And then the part where they take him to the sand dunes and they attack that group of punk rockers. Oh, and the around the fire. Yeah. And one of them's like ripping the scalp off of the top of one of the dudes. And they're just like ripping apart these people and like blood spraying all over the place yeah and then i think the last one's that cave scene where they're hanging where they're sleeping down. Yeah. yeah and they're that trying their a... goal is to go kill them before they wake up and they don't go according to plan well they get marco oh, but they don't get anybody else exactly yeah. that was just like a it was a cool scene just how they're trying to be in tight quarters like that in such tight quarters like, yeah. I don't think you ever see a movie, from my remembering, where you're, like, in that tight of a space with a vampire or vampires coming after you. And they look creepy and scary like that. It's just like... Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. I Yeah. I And I think, like, uh, it's another one, though. I mean, even though it came out in the 80s, it holds up. I mean, it looks amazing. Even now... I, um, yeah, I love that movie. I also like, there's so many different like relationship dynamics. Like you've got the mom, you've got the two brothers, you've got the love interest, you know, you've got, um, Michael and star, you've got the, the vampire guys, you've got their master dad, whatever. Um, but then you've got the frog brothers and like, then their relationship with Sam and like, there's so many relationship dynamics. And even though, you know, I'm not like a vampire group in real life. So many of those connections and those archetypes of who, who these characters are, they all, they're all like, I like realistic, like they all felt very real. They all felt very genuine. Like, you know, when um, Sam goes to the comic store and he tells them, you know, oh, I don't, I don't read horror comics. And they're like, no, but like you want to read this one. Like uh, nothing, not a single scene in that movie felt acted. It all felt just very natural, very real you care about the people involved. I don't know. It's like, it's, it's everything in like one film. It's not just a vampire movie. There's a lot more going on. And then I love the, the, the grandfather is a riot. Like oh, his, yeah. like, he's so funny. He has the best line in the whole movie at the very end when the he's like, that's end. what I hate about living here. There's so many damn vampires. <laughs> he knew the whole fucking time. The whole time. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> And didn't say nothing. Oh, exactly. so good. Yeah. No, I, I feel like that might be another reason why I liked the 80s so much. Is it, it, the character building and everything didn't feel so cardboard cut out. Like it no. didn't, it didn't, it was like 3D. You could almost, you believed it. And nowadays I feel like you're watching these shows on mm -hmm. Netflix or whatnot. And it mm -hmm. feels like the sets are fake. It feels like the characters are just there just yeah. to be there. And it doesn't yeah. feel like organic like that at all. So like I completely, what you were saying earlier about that, mm -hmm. like it, I completely agree. It's yeah, different times. And it, it feels like there was a lot more love put into movies back then. And now it's just like, let's push this out quick, quick, quick. Let's follow mm -hmm. this rhythm and push this out and try to make money. Instead of let's build something out of love and giving a shit. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and to your point, when I talk about movies, you know, newer ones in general, I, I find myself often saying, you know, the reasons that movies fall flat for me is because I don't feel connected to anyone in the, you know, and some movies, don't get me wrong. Some horror movies, you, you're not really supposed to, and that's fine. Sometimes it really is just a lot of kill in or a lot of whatever, and that's fine. But the movies that where, where it shouldn't be that way, where you should be able to connect to at least one character and you can't, that makes those films super lackluster for me. Cause then I'm just like, well, I don't, I don't really, I'm not fearful because I don't care if they die. I'm not invested in the family. I'm not invested in the friendship or the romance side of it or whatever. I'm not invested in any of that. And then the other thing too, is like, I feel like I know people like the people in the lost boys. Like I know moms like that. I knew friends like that. I my, my brother and I had very similar relationship to like Michael and Sam when we were growing up. Like, I just feel like these things like, like 
just, they feel very real. And now it's like, it's really generic. They're like, okay, so we have to have these five archetypes. So let's cast the five archetypes and we'll just make them fit in this movie about whatever. And it's, it's very generic and dull and it ends up making it hard to be scared or worried in any way because you don't care what happens. Exactly. And yeah. just to add to what you said earlier, I, mm -hmm. I've always wanted a dog like Nanook as well. Oh, Nanook is so pretty and right? protective of Sam, like not playing around dog. when, yeah. Growing up, growing up, I always wanted that hairdo and that style and that kind of dog <laughs> as Sam did. I'm just like, that's, that's my, that's what I want my life to be right now. Yeah. Sam, Sam in the bathtub singing and playing is like a mood as an adult for me. Like, yeah. <laughs> He's like playing. <laughs> it's exactly. so perfect. I'm like, that's literally me. <laughs> like he's <laughs> right. Oh, he, and even when his brother's transforming for like the first time or whatever, and he's like stuck to the ceiling, that was actually a trippy scene too. Yeah. Because I don't know. I don't know if it's ever been depicted like that before like where he could where he have the control he just kind of exactly and he's just like he feels almost like he's like stuck to the ceiling like that yeah. like it was such a trip and like the way his like it's a good point his face was almost getting sucked in almost like he was getting sucked against the ceiling it was weird like it was so you're right believable. yeah and you don't i'm trying to remember yeah. a progression from human to vampire before or after that was like that that was just like memorable like where you're seeing the person go through that type of like what is happening to my body right now yeah that's a really good point i hadn't really thought about that but you're right i don't he really genuinely just does not have control he wakes up and he's like up and he's like uh like full-blown panic doesn't know what to do yeah that's a really good point and and you really do kind of feel panicked with him because you're like what would you do if like you're just like stuck exactly. on the ceiling rolling around and you cannot get down you can't have no control over this thing that's happening to you yeah that that's a really good point i don't i can't think of anything that's else has been done like that the only thing i ever see you know that they talk about in vampire films that's even remotely close to that is just the inability to control the urge to eat or drink but otherwise they don't really dive into those those other pieces that's true the interview with the vampire one was kind of cool where um lestat takes him out to the graveyard and then the the statues and stuff start looking at louis yeah like, that's a cool scene that and was like, cool this is your last was it his last sunset sun or well, sunrise sunrise yeah yeah, yeah. And that, that scene I thought was kind of cool. Yes. Yeah. That is really good too. Uh, well, yeah. Cause that one had like, even, well, that whole thing where he's trying to talk about like his senses being what they weren't before. And yeah, all of that was really well done. I, th and that's the thing is like, that's another thing that's kind of been like pretty, like made very generic is vampire stories because there really is like, other things to explore besides you know sex and blood like there is really like <laughs> there really are like other things to to go into depth about and they don't honestly i feel that way about werewolves too i feel like they just they stick to this like got bitten full moon ruin their lives like that and that's like the you know the copy paste you know description exactly. for all of these films and it's the same way with vampires i mean that's what makes movies like The Lost Boys and even Interview with the Vampire so unique. And they stick out and they're kind of timeless because they haven't been matched. There's nothing like them. Yeah. I still yeah. want to see, like, I want Hollywood to make, like, a good werewolf movie without using CGI of, like, mm -hmm. a werewolf just running on a rampage and ripping people apart. I, that's what I want. I just, I want that to happen before I go. I want to see that <laughs> werewolf movie, right? I want to see that made just so I can just be like, damn, that looks good. And then I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Life is complete. <laughs> right? I, that's my dream movie. I'm still like waiting to see that. Like there's yeah. some movies that are close, but I want to see, I want to see that. Like, I feel in Howling, they didn't have the movement right, you know? 
Same with dog soldiers. Same with They're very robotic. Exactly. Same yeah. with uh, American werewolf. Like they don't really show much. Like I want to see the actual thing yeah. going down. Yeah. So I, yeah. I cabin in the woods, actually, if you've seen that, there's a short werewolf part. I love that. Werewolf actually, that. that looks really good. Like I like you guys can make it happen if you want to, from what I saw there. Like make yeah. it happen. <laughs> yeah, because he I'm pretty sure he's practical. I, he didn't right? look CGI to me. He looks exactly. practical. That's yeah, I like exactly. the werewolf. You I think we see him twice, right? We see him with the elevator yeah. parts, and then he ends up in the bottom of the like the ritual, whatever that thing is at the bottom exactly. with the stones or whatever. Yeah. He's I actually exactly. ironically just rewatched that like a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, werewolves. Well, back to werewolves. So <laughs> Which is a perfect segue for your last one, which is an American werewolf in London, 1981. This is another film that I watched growing up as a kid. And mm -hmm. again, I can thank my uncle for this. He showed me this one. <laughs> he showed me this one, um, Lost Boys and The Howling, actually. So oh, nice. I, I can thank him for these these eighties movies and why I had such a love for that yeah. that genre or that kind of movie. I feel right. like most kids growing up, mm -hmm. it was always like Freddy Krueger, um, yeah. Jason, Halloween, or, yeah, and it's the same ones kind of over and over and over. You're right. It's not, yeah, it's not bad, but it's just like I feel like I'm like. When you see all the people on Instagram, they're all like jumping all over these films. And I'm like, man, I'm such a monster kid. You know, like I loved the vampires and werewolves, but like the, the scary ones, not the, not the twilight. The fru fru the... ones, as I yeah. say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So American <laughs> Werewolf in London was just such that, you know, that friend, fun, like, movie to me that just felt like real because yeah you could you could picture yourself on that adventure with one of your friends you know going out i to totally do that. agree and yeah and i know we did that that we already talked about this but man there's something about this movie that just is always and again the cabin my dad's cabin in the woods i mean it freaks me out just like <laughs> as a kid right so watching these and then going up there at night oh my gosh it was like <laughs> so creepy yeah yeah an american werewolf in london is another one that's a staple for you know werewolf films and horror in general because of that you know all of the things that went into um that transformation and like you said how much of it you can see and it's memorable because I, I, as far as practical goes that's it there's nothing else like that. They the really elaborate um, werewolf transformations, like in the Wolfman remake and the Underworld series, that's all CGI. Like none exactly. of that, um, none mo majority of it is not um, is not practical effects. And so it's it's to me, see, I don't have I don't necessarily have like a problem with CGI, but I'm going to enjoy and have a lot more respect for monsters if they're practical because they look better. And then they age better because if you watch these now, they, they're just as crazy looking. It's not like you watch it and you go, wow, that's really cheesy. Not the case. Like, but you see something from six to 10 years ago that had CGI in it. And it's like, it looks so bad now because of the way that they chose to go about doing it instead of doing practical. So that's, I mean, yeah, American World in London is a really good one too. That's another one that I revisit every so often. Well, what it, it, what it was cool about, you asking me to do this is it really made me think of like well why are these movies the ones that like trigger or make yeah. me think back you know over yeah. the the period of life or whatnot and it was yeah. pretty much if you really think about it the practical effects i mean even the the monkey from the faces, faces of, of death, death. that was practical effects that wasn't a real monkey it was all done with practical effects mm -hmm. and the howling, all the creepy parts in that again. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some parts that were just really good storytelling, camera angles, making it like scary. 
Yeah. Um, Utilizing lot, dark and light. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. A lot of yeah. it did have to do with practical effects as well. You know, that and uh, Lost Boys and American Werewolf, man. Yeah. A lot of good practical effects throughout all of them. And yeah. I think that's what we're missing maybe out of these movies these days. That kind of makes them feel like flat. Well, that's Albert's five influential horror. Never been on, and none of those have ever been on here before. Five. <laughs> <laughs> um, his links, uh, the links for Blood and Bruise for their socials and their YouTube channel are going to be in the description for this episode. Make sure you go give them a follow and sub and, um, and check out their content. Um, thank you again for doing this. This was a blast. Of course. Thank you so much. I love talking horror and mm -hmm. I had fun. Yeah. Thanks. Me too. Uh, thank you guys it. so much for hanging out for this episode of Influential Horror. Have a good rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend and I will see you in the next one.